Hey guys, it's Ellen Brock, novel editor. I hope you're all doing really, really well. Today, we are gonna talk about the third quarter. If you missed my other videos in this story structure series, I recommend that you watch them first so that you have a better idea of what we're talking about. But today we're talking about the third quarter, or if you prefer three act structure, we're talking about the second half of the second act or the space between the midpoint and the second plot point. So as always with these videos, I will be using films um, as the examples. So if you're worried about spoilers in this video, I'm going to be giving fairly significant spoilers to Shrek, The Sixth Sense, The Woman in Black, The Kid, Toy Story, and Liar Liar. So last time we touched on the midpoint um, a little bit, but I want to touch on the midpoint again because it's very important in getting the structure right for the third quarter. So making sure that you're really nailing the midpoint is gonna make it a lot easier to get this third quarter right. The most important thing to keep in mind about the midpoint is that the protagonist will have a better understanding of what's going on. So they will have what sometimes referred to as one eye open. They'll have a, a better sense of um, direction and a goal that's a little bit more precise or their action towards that goal will become more precise. So it may not necessarily be that their circumstances changed, but their actions have become more directed and they have a better sense of what they need to do. So they would have been more fish out of water in the second quarter. So now in this third quarter, they're a little bit more aware, a little bit more proactive, etc. Like we talked about in the previous video, it's possible that the interpretation of the information at the midpoint could be incorrect, could be flawed, um, could be just a full misunderstanding, or they might just have only gotten one piece of information or half of the information, but they don't really understand everything. It's really important that the protagonist not have a complete and full understanding of the plot at the midpoint because at the end of this third quarter, we have another major turning point, the second plot point, and we want to be able to use that to, again, advance the plot and um, provide another moment of realization. And the second plot point realization will be the sort of both eyes open realization. It will be a full understanding and interpretation of the plot, uh, the antagonist plan, or perhaps just um, what the protagonist needs to do to succeed. So it sort of depends a little bit on how plot driven versus character driven your story is, whether it's more literal interpretation of um, say the antagonist plan or something more internal, more understanding of what they need to do or how they need to change. So that's going to depend a lot on the individual story. So the second plot point is going to, in many cases, sort of fill in a blank that was left by the midpoint. So I just want to illustrate that a little bit here with some examples. So in Toy Story, um, in the midpoint, Buzz, he realizes, he sees an ad and he sort of realizes, you know, I am a toy. I'm not a space ranger. I'm not this special person that I thought I was. And he gets really unhappy and really depressed. At the second plot point, um, he gets... Uh, sort of a pep talk from Woody and he has this realization that even though he's not a space ranger, he's still really important. He's this toy that means a lot to this little boy. So at the midpoint we have a realization, but it's not a complete picture. And then later at the end of this third quarter when we get the second plot point, we sort of get the last piece or the missing element um, to give the complete picture, which is, yeah, he's not a space ranger, but he is still really important to Andy. He still has value. Another good example is in The Kid. We talked about The Kid in the last video, I believe, um, in that that's a good example of the protagonist misinterpreting the situation at the midpoint. So in The Kid, Russell is visited by this child version of himself who's only eight years old. And at the midpoint, he has this realization that, you know, this kid's probably here because I need to help him. I need to help him become more like me to be um, stronger, a better fighter, more charismatic, etc. And he sort of views his child self as a sort of loser, dweeb kind of kid. At uh, the second plot point, he realizes the actual correct interpretation, which is that the kid's actually there um, to help him, to make him more like how he used to be as a kid, rather than the other way around. So at the midpoint, there is a realization in that case, but it's not correct. Um, only the gist is correct. One of them's there to help the other one, but but the um, direction that goes is incorrect. So he realizes the actual truth at the second plot point. 
So I hope that sort of gives you an idea of how the midpoint and the second plot point relate to each other. Another sort of similar um, midpoint, second plot point uh, arrangement is in The Sixth Sense. So in The Sixth Sense, Malcolm is a therapist. He's helping this troubled boy named Cole. At the midpoint, Cole tells him that he sees dead people, you know, he sees ghosts. And Malcolm doesn't believe him. He thinks he has childhood schizophrenia. He thinks that, you know, he's not able to help this boy and he's not thinking anything supernatural is occurring. At the second plot point, he realizes, yes, actually, this is supernatural. This kid actually is seeing dead people. So the midpoint often is a, excuse me, the midpoint often is a misinterpretation that's then clarified at the second plot point. Um, sometimes it's just a piece of information, like half the information, and then the other half is, is uh, delivered at the second plot point. So it's also important to keep in mind that the character's misinterpretation does not have to be uh, morally wrong or, or cruel or built on something very negative. So I don't want people to feel that they need to give their characters these really gross or unappealing flaws. Uh, for example, Buzz Lightyear isn't doing something wrong by believing he's a space ranger. He just is wrong. So uh, similar with Malcolm, he wants to help Cole in the sixth sense. He wants to help the little boy. Um, he isn't malicious or trying to do something wrong. So I just want people to be aware that you don't have to give the character really unappealing um, flaws or personality traits to achieve the structure. So now that we've gone over the midpoint um, in a little bit more depth and how it relates to the third quarter, let's move on to what happens after the midpoint. So immediately following the midpoint, what usually happens, not 100% of the time, but most in most cases, there will be a, a little bit of an emotional breakdown or an emotional downturn. The character will become sort of unhappy, uh, maybe a little bit depressed. It, this is mainly because they've just had a big realization at the midpoint, and this is going to be an emotional reaction to that. This moment can, in some cases, be extremely brief, just a moment, a brief moment in time. Uh, in others, it may be many scenes long. This may be a prolonged emotional down downturn. So it sort of depends on the story that you're telling. The, the, uh, the thing to keep in mind with this is that this is not the dark night of the soul or the lowest point or anything. Um, there's several terms for it. Uh, we will get into that later in the video because it does occur in the third quarter, but this is not that moment. This is just a little bit of a downturn. It's not hopeless. Um, the character's not giving up. They're not thinking there's no way out at this point. They're just kind of, uh, you know, reacting a little bit heavy perhaps to this realization they had at the midpoint. And it's just a natural sort of emotional reaction. For example, uh, in the film Liar Liar, um, Fletcher is the protagonist in that his son wishes on his birthday cake that his father won't be able to tell a lie. At the midpoint, he realizes that this is the reason that he hasn't been able to lie all day. He also realizes that he's been a bad father um, and that he's probably going to lose his son because his ex-wife is going to move her, um, herself and, and their son to Boston. Uh, immediately following that midpoint, we sort of see him unhappy at work. He he seems kind of depressed. He talks to a secretary about how he doesn't think he's going to be able to win this court case uh, because he can't lie, so he doesn't think he's going to be able to succeed. Uh, and it's not that he's given up. He's not not trying, but there's definitely a little bit of a, of a heavy feeling or a sad feeling um, for the character at that point. A good example of a brief emotional downturn is in The Sixth Sense. Um, after Cole tells Malcolm that he sees dead people, Malcolm goes outside and he sort of records um, into a little tape recorder his uh, notes on the session or his notes on this interaction with the boy. And he says, you know, I think he has childhood schizophrenia and I think I'm not helping him. And he looks really unhappy, um, but that's it. It's a brief moment and then the story sort of picks up from there. So it doesn't need to be a prolonged downturn um, depending on the story. Sometimes this structure takes a little bit of a different form, especially this is common in kids media or family media. Um, the midpoint might be more of an accomplishment for the protagonist, but the emotional downturn will be given to a side character or a secondary character. So uh, Shrek is a good example of this. At the midpoint, he uh, saves Fiona from the castle, which is what uh, Lord Farquaad said he had to do if he wanted to get his swamp back. He had to save Fiona. He does. So that's not 
a negative thing for him. He's not having a, a real big emotional problem there. But the emotional downturn is given to Fiona, who expected to be saved by a prince, and she ends up being saved by an ogre. So she's sort of unhappy. In this case, the secondary character's emotional reaction becomes an obstacle or creates a little bit more difficulty for the protagonist. So Shrek sort of has to carry Fiona off with him, and um, it has sort of a negative emotional effect on him as well that she's so disappointed to see that he is an ogre. Another good example of this is, again, Toy Story. Buzz is the one who has this big emotional downturn, realizing that he's not um, a real space ranger, that he's actually just a toy. And uh, this makes him uncooperative with Woody. So Woody and Buzz um, need to escape Sid's house, this kid who likes to destroy toys, and they need to get home before their own boy moves away. And um, he needs Buzz to cooperate with that, but Buzz is depressed, he's unhappy, and he's just completely uncooperative. So that becomes an obstacle for Woody, but Woody himself isn't really the one having the emotional downturn in that moment. So that's a different sort of structure that can take. Um, again, keep in mind, this is not the lowest point, so we're not going to see hopelessness from the protagonist. You might see hopelessness from a side character, but not the protagonist. The protagonist is still moving forward. Um, they're still engaged in the conflict. So the next step typically that we see in the majority of stories is um, emotions will sort of be brought into light or verbalized. So throughout the story, we've probably had a pretty good awareness of what this character's flaw was, the protagonist's flaw. We, we knew, um, you know, they had whatever issue that they had, but it wasn't verbalized. No one outright said this is why this character sucks or this is why this character uh, needs to grow. And at this point it is when we typically see a side character, um, sometimes it will be the protagonist. They will choose to divulge information willingly, but often this uh, conversation, this verbalization of the emotions, the underlying feelings, flaws, etc., will come from a side character. Sometimes they're asking questions, sometimes they're outright chastising the protagonist for bad behavior, um, they might be needling them about something that they've been hiding about their past, and then typically at this point if there is anything that you've been um, hiding as the writer, any information that hasn't been divulged, we will typically see it uh, be divulged here. So any um, pieces of backstory or, or uh, maybe a secret flaw, if the flaw is, hasn't really been explained outright, that will typically come to light in this section. So. A good example of this is in Shrek, um, Donkey, they, they've been traveling and then they stop to rest and Donkey asks Shrek about the wall around his swamp and says, you know, what are you trying to keep out? Why do you have this wall? And Shrek says he's trying to keep out everyone and that the world has a problem with him. And we know that he has thought this, it's pretty obvious that Shrek has thought that the world has a problem with him, but this is a verbalization of that. It's sort of a heart to heart where that is brought into the light and focused on. Another good example of this is in The Kid. So in The Kid, Russell, the adult Russell and his coworker Amy are watching Russell's eight-year-old kid self. And Russell sort of says, you know, doesn't seeing him make you despise me? You know, he's a dweeb, he's a loser. And he talks very negatively about his child self. And Amy, his coworker says, you know, no, she thinks he's cute. And she asks, do you despise yourself? And, um, the adult Russell says that, you know, he basically, yeah, he does despise himself and that seeing himself as a kid reminds him of, of all these negative childhood memories and makes him unhappy. And it's a verbalization of something that we, we have seen, but now it's really being focused on and brought to light. And then again, uh, with Toy Story, we actually see this come more from Buzz where Woody confronts Buzz and Buzz says, um, you know, he Woody finds Buzz at the tea party with the decapitated dolls uh, in Sid's sister's room and um, Woody, you know, says, come on, you know, let's go. And Buzz says, you know, he's a sham, he's a fraud, like he's not a real space ranger and he's very unhappy and depressed and they have sort of a, a verbalization of the underlying emotional problem. So that's typically what you will see at this point. Next, you'll usually have a failed attempt to solve a problem. So this failure at this point, it typically is sort of a almost a punishment for previous actions. So it's not that the character in this moment is necessarily doing something irrational or dumb or something that doesn't make sense. It's that the reason they fail is because of something that they set up earlier or a mistake that they made earlier, a flaw um, or a misinterpretation, something that's connected to sort of the emotional core of the story. So 
For example, in Toy Story, Woody tries to get the toys um, in Andy's room to help him across the window. So they're next door at Sid's house, this kid who likes to destroy toys. Uh, Woody goes up to the window. He tries to get his friends across the street to help him cross over through the window. They won't help him because of how he treated Buzz earlier in the film because they feel that he should save Buzz and if he doesn't have Buzz with him now and Buzz as we mentioned is uncooperative, he's depressed so he's not um, willing to sort of go to the window and be like, hey guys, I'm, I'm fine, you know, help us get across. He's depressed. Um, so Buzz won't help him. The toys don't believe Woody uh, and um, that is sort of something that Woody caused but not in this moment. So it's sort of something that he set up as a problem for himself earlier on. So that's sort of the nature of the failure at this point. It's typically something that was set up earlier um, in the story. So another example would be in Shrek. He sort of rehearses telling Fiona how he feels. He has flowers. He's going to go to her and tell her, you know, that he cares about her and has romantic feelings towards her. And he ends up overhearing her talking negatively about him. And this is really uh, something that's sort of set up both from Fiona and um, Shrek's flaws. So Fiona does, uh, if you're not familiar with the story, Fiona turns into an ogre at night and she doesn't want anyone to know this. They, she wants everyone to think she's just a beautiful princess all the time. So she sort of hides at night. So he overhears Donkey and Fiona talking about this and thinks that what Fiona is talking about is Shrek himself. And this is sort of built on both the flaw of uh, Shrek believing the world is against him and Fiona believing that, you know, she can't tell the truth about the fact that she turns into an ogre. So he overhears her say, you know, princess and ugly don't go together. He thinks she's talking about him. And so his plan fails there. He doesn't end up telling her how he feels. He sort of drops the flowers and walks away. So this uh, failure here typically is not a meticulously planned attack on the antagonist. This is more of a spur of the moment thing in most cases. So in most stories, this is sort of an impulsive uh, attempt to solve the problem or it's more in the moment. It's not something that they've been planning for, for an extended period of time. So a good example of this is in Liar Liar. Uh, Fletcher goes to the bathroom during the court case. He can't lie, so he's really not doing well in this court case. And he comes up with this idea that maybe he can beat himself up, pretend like he was attacked in the bathroom, and then they'll postpone the court case as a result of that. So he does beat himself up in the bathroom, and then he comes into the court case, and the judge asks him, you know, well, you know, he bas the judge basically says, well, we should reconvene another time. You know, you just got beat up unless you think you can continue. And because Fletcher can't tell a lie, which is something that was established earlier on in, in a response to his own failing. So his son wished on his birthday cake that he wouldn't be able to lie because of his own flaws. He now can't lie. So he then tells the judge, yeah, I can continue. And so his plan uh, is foiled because of that. Another example is the woman in black. In The Woman in Black, Arthur tries to save a child from a burning building. He tries to save this child from the ghost, uh, but he fails and the child dies. And uh, he's obviously very uh, unhappy and heartbroken about this. Um, this movie is a little bit tricky because actually, um, and again, I'm going to completely spoil this movie, but uh, the, the, book, the ghost can't be stopped. And so his flaw here basically is thinking that he can stop the ghost, even though he's been presented with evidence um, that the ghost can't be stopped. So that's sort of where, where the previously established failure comes from um, in this film. So after this failure, typically what happens is things get even worse. And this usually takes the form of time running out, a ticking clock, a plan that's revealed, or a secret that comes to light. Most things will fall somewhere in that category in terms of what makes things get worse at this point. This should create a really big, insurmountable obstacle, a major calamity. This is a, a big, big blow to the character and this should be very obvious to the viewer or the reader. This is not a subtle plot point. This is a very big calamity. This is sort of a everything um, has gone out the window kind of um, problem, a big, big problem. So a good example of this is Toy Story. So in Toy Story, uh, Sid straps a rocket onto Buzz. It's sort of like a firework that's gonna explode. And he literally sets a timer and puts it down. And that's where you get the ticking clock or the time is running out element. So in the morning when this alarm goes off, 
um, Sid is going to set off this rocket and Buzz is going to explode. And also uh, as a, a sort of double whammy, um, their boy Andy is moving the next day. So if they don't get home tonight, they're going to miss the moving bus anyway. So you sort of get a double element of time is running out. Another example is in The Woman in Black. Um, a psychic woman tells Arthur that the ghost is going to be after his own son and his son is coming into town the next day on the train. Um, so he knows then that when his son comes into town, um, this ghost is going to try to kill his son. Um, this may be less... Um, overt in situations where there isn't a clear antagonist or, or where there's not a bad guy or a villain. So for example, in The Sixth Sense, um, Malcolm is actually the one who causes this plot point to occur. So Malcolm, the um, adult, the therapist who's trying to help Cole, the child, he believes that his wife is falling in love with another man. And so he decides, you know, this this is bad you know I'm losing my wife you know I'm our marriage is falling apart I need to do something right now and he is the one who tells Cole you know I can't be your doctor anymore I can't help you anymore so he's sort of self-creating this sort of um, calamity moment um, another example of this is in Shrek so in Shrek um, Fiona is really hurt by uh, Shrek's behavior and sort of the way that he's talking to her but of course Fiona is also really worried about the fact that she turns into an ogre at night and she doesn't want anyone to know that so she actually sets the ticking clock um, because she wants to get married to Lord Farquaad before the sun goes down so that Lord Farquaad does not see that she turns into an ogre at night so she's the one who sort of sets that ticking clock deadline of um, getting married before the sun goes down. So even though there is an overt antagonist uh, with Lord Farquaad, um, Fiona is actually the one who sets that ticking clock herself. In some cases, this will take the form of a secret that's been revealed. So something the character lied about earlier on, the protagonist told a lie or hid something and that will be revealed here. And it will sort of cause a breakdown of relationships or cause a sort of calamity, usually of a sort of interpersonal nature. The Kid is a good example of that. In The Kid, Russell uh, told his coworker Amy that he destroyed a tape. Um, they're sort of um, image consultants and they help people look, sort of look good in the media. And there was this really nasty client and Russell filmed this video of him that tried to sort of present him in a better light, but it wasn't very truthful. Uh, he told Amy that he destroyed it, but he actually lied and he didn't destroy it. Um, and Amy sees that tape play on the news and that's sort of what creates this calamity. She sees, you know, he didn't really destroy this tape and she realizes that he lied. So that's what sort of causes this moment in that film. So whatever form this takes, it should appear at this point that the protagonist has no way to succeed. There is no obvious um, way to reconcile the problem. There's no obvious fix. The reader needs to be, or the viewer needs to be really right there with that protagonist feeling like there is no obvious way out of this situation. And that is what will spark the all is lost, the dark night of the soul, the lowest point, whatever term you want to use, the most hopeless point of the story. So at this point, the protagonist will typically feel very unhappy, typically pretty depressed, hopeless. They may not really even be trying anymore at all to solve the problem because they have no idea what to do. They, they have no chance um, as far as they're aware of solving the problem at this point. So um, a good example of this is in Shrek. Shrek has a fairly prolonged um, dark night, especially for a children's film. It's, it's a bit longer than I think you would expect. And he sort of has a falling out um, with Donkey. So Fiona leaves, she goes off with Lord Farquaad and then Donkey's like sort of trying to be friends with Shrek again and Shrek rejects him because he's mad because of the conversation he overheard between Donkey and Fiona and he thinks that Donkey sort of sold him out to Fiona and was sort of talking bad about him behind his back. We then get a very sad montage of um, Fiona um, getting married, Donkey being on his own and Shrek being on his own in his swamp and everybody is really unhappy and sad and there's no obvious solution to the problem at this point. Another good example of this is in The Sixth Sense. So Malcolm um, is very unhappy about not working with Cole anymore. For him, this is also um, representative of another failure. So he failed with a previous client with similar problems. So during that um, down point, this dark night, he's sort of sitting looking over the old case files of his other client that he feels that he failed. And um, 
just being very unhappy because this was something that he wanted to resolve from his past. He thought by fixing um, Cole's problem now, it would be like he had saved this other um, client of his from the past that he feels that he failed. So this is a very unhappy time for him to be reflecting on that. It's very unhappy and there's not a clear solution. In The Woman in Black, Arthur gets to the train station to try to get home before, um, before his son boards the train so that he can stop his son from getting on the train and coming into the town where the ghost lives. But the train station is already closed. He can't get to his son. His son is going to come into town and the ghost is going to end up going after his son. So this is a very low, um, unfortunate circumstance, big calamity, big emotional blow to the character. And this will lead to the very last element of the third quarter, which is the major realization at the second plot point. So like we talked about earlier in the video, the second plot point typically is going to be filling in some kind of blank from the midpoint or providing a correct interpretation of something that was misinterpreted at the midpoint. You can typically think of this as sort of the last piece of information that's necessary for the character to move into the climactic sequence or the fourth quarter. So this is the last sort of big new piece of information they need to formulate their attack plan or to know what to do in order to stop the antagonistic force or solve their problem. So usually, um, not always, but, but in many, many cases, there will be a sort of pep talk that occurs. Usually a side character could be a sort of um, parental figure, a teacher type figure, could just be a smart best friend. Um, it's usually a, a more side character. So it's usually not um, the closest secondary character. It's usually a little bit um, more of a distant character, but it could be a close character. It could be, really could be anyone, but it's fairly common that there will be a pep talk. Um, in The Kid, we talked about earlier, um, in the second plot point, he realizes through having a conversation with a, a very side character, really an incidental character, um, he takes this woman out to have coffee and she tells him, you know, this kid is here to help you, you're not here to help the kid. So again, we fill in that sort of blank or we correct that misinterpretation at the midpoint and she's the one who sort of gives him this pep talk and this explanation that sort of sparks his realization about what needs to happen. Um, in Toy Story, Woody is actually the one. So again, here we do have a close character uh, giving the pep talk. He's actually the um, protagonist of the film. But like we mentioned with um, kids stories, there may sometimes be sort of shared plot points between a couple characters. So Buzz and Woody are almost co-protagonists um, in the film. And Woody actually is the one who gives the pep talk. Uh, it's a little bit unhappy and depressing, but um, Buzz feels, you know, uh, that he's a failure and that he has nothing to offer and he's not a real space ranger. And Woody talks to him about how important he is to Andy and how, uh, you know, he says there's a kid next door who really needs you. And this is actually a dual uh, point of realization because uh, this actually, it sparks Buzz into action. It gets Buzz to sort of say, okay, let's do it. You know, I do have importance. I am valuable. Let's go let's let's try to solve this problem um it is also a realization for woody's because he realizes that he hasn't been putting andy's needs first in his jealousy with buzz so here we have more of an emotional realization um maybe kind of unusual for that type of story especially a kid story or more action story uh, often the second plot point realization um will be more plot driven uh but it's often not the case like the, when we talk about the um how structure plays out as part of why I wanted to do, to do this series. Uh, it's not always how you might expect. So this is more of an emotional um, realization here. And then that sort of sparks them into action with the climactic sequence. There are then of course, plot element realizations and plans and things that happen as well. But that big moment is more um, emotionally focused. So uh, the pep talk, of course, is not required in the sixth sense. Malcolm is sort of uh, listening, like I mentioned, he's listening to these old uh, tapes from his previous client who he associates with Cole, the, the main boy in the film. Um, and he realizes on this tape that he actually can hear a ghost. So on the tape for his old client, he hears a ghost and he has the realization, you know, if, if this um, boy wasn't lying about hearing dead people, then maybe this boy Cole also isn't lying about being visited by dead people. So that's the realization for uh, Malcolm. Malcolm actually does give a pep talk to Cole and when he goes to Cole and he tells Cole, you know, maybe these ghosts just need your help. Maybe you should try to reach out and, and actually help them. 
In many cases, especially in genre fiction, the second plot point will really just be putting together pieces of information or clues that were previously acquired in a different way. So a good example of that is The Woman in Black. Arthur sort of already has all the clues that he needs and all the information, but he realizes based on things that he's already experienced that perhaps if he were to reunite the corpse of the child with the corpse of the mother, who is the ghost the woman in black who's killing kids, maybe that would ease her suffering and she would stop killing people. So that's sort of a realization not really built on any new information in the moment, but more just uh, putting together information in a new way. So this second plot point can take a variety of forms. It may or may not be very plot focused. It may or may not be very emotionally focused. It's going to depend a lot on your individual story. What this uh, second plot point will always do is it will end the hopelessness. It will end the dark night. It will, it will jettison that character out of that depression and into a sort of take charge, let's go, you know, let's move into the climactic sequence. They might still be afraid, they might be so worried, um, but they're not hopeless, they're not giving up, they're no longer in that, that sort of depressive state. So whether it's getting out of that depressive state requires a pep talk, an emotional realization, or more of just putting together plot pieces or putting together clues, it's very dependent on your story, the tone you're going for, etc. But it will always end that sort of hopeless depression and it will sort of um, set the protagonist off into the fourth quarter into that climactic sequence, which is what we will talk about in the next video. So just as a quick refresher, the sequence of events for the third quarter, in most cases, not all, but in most cases, there will be an emotional downturn after the midpoint. It's usually brief. It may be long. It's never going to be super hopeless. The character is not going to be giving up here. In some cases, it may be the side character who gets this emotional point. Then emotions will come to light or emotions will be verbalized, backstory may be revealed, uh, the nature of the flaw may be revealed, anything that hasn't been overtly said will often be outright stated here, sometimes by a side character sort of bullying, yelling at, needling, questioning the protagonist. But it may also just be um, a heart-to-heart uh, -heart that the protagonist initiates in some cases. Next, there will be a failed attempt to succeed. This failure will be something that is related to what the character set up earlier, so related to, to a mistake the character made in the past. Their actions, though logical now, will not work, and it is basically their own fault based on something. It, to some capacity, it's their own fault based on something they did earlier on. The next is that things will get even worse. Usually a plan is revealed, a secret's revealed, a clock is ticking, or time is running out, and this sort of gives that real crunch time moment um, where the stakes become really, really high. Uh, this will lead to the dark night of the soul, lowest point, um, whatever you want to refer to that as. And this will be a sort of depression because the, the protagonist will realize there is no way out of the situation where they don't know any way out. From that, there will be an optional pep talk, possibly from a side character, in most cases from a side character, but as we saw, it, it can be coming from a main character. And then there will be a major realization, which is the second plot point, and this will be something that takes them out of that depression and sets them on that path into the fourth quarter uh, to, to go through the climactic sequence and actually confront the antagonist or the antagonistic force or their problem. So. I really hope this gave you a better understanding of what happens in the third quarter. Um, I know this can be a really tricky section. The middle can feel very daunting and big, and, and I'm hoping that this series is helping break down structure into a little bit more understandable, digestible, and useful parts. Um, if you have any questions, as always, put them in the comments. I will prob probably be making some follow-up videos that go into uh, deeper analysis of, of films and books so that we can look a little bit more at these plot points, but I'm really hoping that this video series is helping you guys. The next video will be on the fourth quarter. Um, I want to say a very, very, very huge thank you to my Patreon supporters who supported me while I was sick. It really, really meant a lot to me. It really helped me out a ton. And um, I really can't thank you enough for, for your support during that time. It really, really meant a lot to me. With that said, I hope you are all doing really well, that you are all staying healthy and um, that your writing is going well and that you're finding these videos helpful. I will be back again. I'm not exactly sure. I'm still not 100% healthy, but I'm hoping it will not be too long um, before I get back. But in the meantime, happy writing, guys.